you know, live uh, chat. Thank you, um, everyone, and good evening, um, members uh, and the public and officers. My name is uh, Councillor Havinder Singh Verdi, and welcome to the Local Development Committee delivered, delivered by Zoom and on YouTube. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Thank you very much. I will not now ask members of the committee and officers to introduce themselves. And the usual practice we have is as per the page two of the agenda. So we start off with myself as I've already introduced myself. Councillor Muggle, is he here? No. Hello, yes. good evening, everyone. I'm Councillor oh, Mushtaq Mughal from Green Street West Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hanif? No. So, can we carry on with Anne? I'm Councillor Anne Easter, and I represent Canning Town North. Councillor Gray? No. Councillor Griffiths? I'm Councillor Alan Griffiths from Canning Town South. Councillor Khan? <coughs> Councillor Mariba Khan, Bowling Ward. Councillor McLean? Councillor Patel? Councillor Salim Patel from Manor Park Ward. Uh, Councillor Mohammed Rahman? Hi, this is Councillor Mujibur Rahman, Councillor for Green Street East. And Tamina Rahman? No. Do we have any apologies for absence? Uh, Chair, I'm just checking. I won't be a moment. I do apologise. We probably do have, but uh, I just need to check. I won't keep you a second. And we've got no official apologies, Chair, no. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Item two, um, any the minutes of the meeting held on 26th of October and 23rd of November for approval on pages one to 24. I'm not going to go through the, the page numbers like normal procedure, but uh, is there anything for us to note? Or are members happy with the minutes? Are we happy? Yeah. Okay, so just to know from your last meeting, Councillor Easter, you did ask the question, and I think we agreed that uh, we were going to agree all the minutes on this on this meeting. That's right, indeed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, the, all those in favour of the minutes, can I see a show of hands, please? Happy with the minutes? Thank you very much. Uh, are there any declarations of interest in any of the items to be discussed today? Councillor Griffiths? Uh, yes, item 10, Chair, is quite close to my home. Okay. Any other member? Um, I am the ward councillor for Canning Town North, uh, Chair. So um, there are two items from Canning Town North. Uh, sorry, Officer uh, Alexander, she has something to say? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Just to um, clarify um, Councillor Griffith's um, declaration, um, I, I take it, Councillor, you do not feel that the application is, it, it may be close to your home, but um, do you feel that um, your ability to decide and consider the matter with a um, with an open mind is in any way conflicted by the person. Oh, I, I don't think so. It's two or three hundred yards away, but I thought I should mention it. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Thank you for asking the question. <laughs> and um, Councillor Easter, um, Jeb, we, we sort of, we know that you're um, down as a speaker on one of the, on one of the items, 143 to 147 Barking Road, where you're speaking for the objectors, I understand? Yes, for the residents <laughs> who've objected. And um, I take it that item, you are conflicted 
um, you've um, sort of closed your mind to that item, would you, would you have, and you will not be taking part in the debate? Or the um, which, whichever you advise. If, 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 if you're speaking for the, um, the objectors, um, I, I, can I take it that you've um, closed your mind to the item? You I see not... what you mean. Yes, yes, indeed. Okay, so 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 in that place, we, we'll, we're having you down as a um, as a speaker, but you won't be taking part in the either the debate or the vote on that item. No, right, so. I understand. Thank you. Okay, now item four, which is descending planning applications. Members are asked to note the advice of head of legal services on determining planning applications. Is that noted? Thank you very much. Before we proceed, could I ask the, uh, the officers to introduce themselves, please? And I see Councillor Gray has joined us. Uh, if you want to introduce himself uh, after the officers, thank you. Um, hello, Chair. Thank you very much. I'll start with the officers. So I am Jane Custance. So I'm the Director of Planning and Development. And um, hello to everybody that I haven't met previously. And I'll hand over to Hannah to introduce herself next. Hello, uh, my name's Hannah Richardson and I'm the Development Manager from the Local Planning Authority. Alexander Dwyer, Solicitor. Ian Pinmonti Hyde, Transport Officer. Harriet Beattie, Principal Planning Officer. Helen Young, Planning Officer. Scott Stevens, Planning Officer. Abigail Fishburn, Planning Officer. Hello, members. Um, I'm Lutman Desai, the Council's Governance Lawyer. I'm here just for the draft planning protocol item. Thank you. Councillor Gray. Yeah, apologies for lateness, Chair. I had problems with um, my computer. Councillor John Gray, West Ham Ward, member of, of this committee. Thank you. And that's all the officers. Um, I've got a couple of announcements to make. Um, the first one is that item number six has been withdrawn yes, from the agenda, good. which is uh, two, uh, two A to two B Windmill Lane. So Very please good. bear that in mind. And the committee has received a, uh, a request to address the committee. The speakers, uh, when I call themselves out, can I call them out, and they please identify themselves. For item seven, um, 34 to 36, uh, Sutton Road. And then we've got item seven, land between 2A and, sorry, 2A and 2A, 2A Clinton Road, Forest Gate. We've got objector. And then on item nine, um, we've got the rear of 143 to 147, Barking Road, um, Councillor Easter. The usual practice is to allow five minutes each to both the supporters and the objectors. Is that agreed? Agreed. Members? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, before we move on, can I request that we move agenda item 12 to the beginning so that uh, we have uh, Council Officer uh, Lukeman, who's with us. Um, if he can move to the end item, the planning protocols. Um, if we take that item first, that way um, yes. I can leave the meeting. Um, my suggestion is that we take this item as a, uh, at a separate meeting altogether. We know what's there uh, for now. Uh, considering that the Strategic Development Committee are doing a similar thing where we have a scheduled meeting rather than just going through the, the schedule as it is. So we'd have a meeting in January sometime uh, at the same time with the Strategic. Uh, Lukman, do you think, I think this is item which uh, Strategic actually undertook as well. So, Chair, I, th I think that's eminently sensible. Um, we will be engaging with um, 
the strategic development committee members um, as um, as we wish to engage the, the members of this committee. So it makes perfect sense for, for it to be considered uh, by both committees um, at the same time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lukman. Uh, are members in favour of that, that we take this as a joint meeting with strategic, a way we can spend sufficient time uh, going through the planning protocols as they are, which then will be presented to the council um, later on in the year. Those members in favour? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was unanimous. Thank you very much, uh, Lukeman, for joining us for this item. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Uh, you're welcome to stay on for the rest of the meeting uh, if you wish. Um, thank you for that offer, Chair. Um, unfortunately, I've got other commitments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we'll proceed with the first item then, which is item seven, as the item six has been withdrawn. Thank you, Chair. I'm just showing my screen now. Please, can I confirm, Chair, can everyone see yep. my screen? Uh, sorry, Chair, is that a yes? That's yes. a yes. Yeah. Oh, Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members and members of the public. The application I'm presenting today is development site at 34 to 36 Sutton Road, Plasto, E13, 8EX. I'd like to draw members' attention to the officer's update, which outlines changes to the report relating to updates to conditions, the receipt of an additional consultation response from the Environment Agency, and some changes to the daylight and sunlight assessment section of the committee report. This is the application site highlighted in yellow, and it lies on the eastern side of Sutton Road in a residential area. To the north of the site are the properties of King Street, which are three-story blocks of flats separated from the application site by a footway. Mm -hmm. To the east of the site are blocks one to nine and 11 to 25 Luton Road, mm -hmm. which range from two to three stories. To the south of the site um, are three-story blocks of flats, 38 to 66 Croydon Road, and to the west of the site, a four-story block of flats, which is three to 45 Sutton Road. During the course of the application, a prior approval for demolition application was submitted to the council. Prior approval was found to be required and approved, and as such, the buildings on the site have been demolished. The application seeks planning permission for the construction of a five-storey block of flats to provide 29 affordable residential units, comprising a tenure of eight one-bedroom units, two one-bedroom wheelchair accessible units, eight two-bedroom units, 10 three-bedroom units, one three-bedroom wheelchair accessible unit. All the proposed units will be provided at London affordable rent. The proposal also will provide associated landscaping, boundary treatments and cycle parking. This is a visual of the proposed block as seen from the northern end of Sutton Road. In terms of the acceptability proposal, due regard has to be given to the acceptability of the proposed use, which is 100% genuinely affordable housing, and the proposal not making provision for the redelivery of the Amber Project uses, which had been on site up to 2016. I will address the acceptability of the proposed residential uses first. The London plan policies identify a pressing need for more homes of varying sizes and tenures. Local plan policy H1 outlines the need for additional quality homes of mixed housing type, size and tenure. Proposed development will provide 29 affordable dwellings on a vacant undeveloped site. Residential development of the site will positively contribute to the borough's housing stock, noting the demand for increased housing. 
it is noted that the local area is predominantly residential in character. As such, the principle of a new genuine affordable housing is supported. I will now turn to assessing the principle of the department not seeking to reprovide the AMBER project uses on site. As such, due regard has to be given to the policy context regarding community services, particularly local plan policy INF8. It's important to understand the history and background of the site and the decision-making context under which the AMBER project vacated the site. The AMBER project vacated the site in 2016 and the site has since been vacant with the exception of squatters. The AMBER project was a residential family centre with associated offices and flats for the purpose of court ordered parenting observations. It should be noted that the flats were not occupied for residential purposes. For consultation with the council's children and young people service, it is understood that the AMBER project services were relocated to Newham Dockside as part of a planned review of services under which it was concluded that the AMBER project should be taken back in house. This co-location of council services is in line with Draft London Plan Policy S1. It should be noted that the Charitine's Residential Family Centre, which is located less than a mile from the site, provides a similar service to that previously provided by the AMBER project. It is noted that planning policies encourage the location of community users in town centres, so they are more accessible. It is noted that the application site fall outside a town centre and has a modest p-tail of three. In July 2019, Newham's Cabinet approved the use of the site to deliver affordable housing as part of the Mayor's Affordable Housing Programme. Given the relocation of the Amber Project services and the site's outer centre location, the lack of re re replacement community facilities is not considered to be unacceptable. In making this decision, due regard has been given to the impact on those with protected characteristics in line with the requirements of the public sector equality duty. In summary, the principle of the development is supported. I will now address the housing offer, turning first to the dwelling mix and affordable housing provision. Local plan policies seek an increase in family and affordable housing. The proposal will deliver 100% London affordable rent units and will also deliver 38% family accommodation which falls just 1% below the 39% family accommodation target as outlined in local plan policy. An independent assessment of the viability review was carried out by BMPP. This demonstrated that the proposal exceeded the maximum reasonable proportion of affordable housing. Although it should be noted that 100% affordable units will not specifically benefit those on higher incomes, it will have a positive impact on those with protected characteristics as identified by the Equalities Act, as several of these groups have low incomes. The need for this typology is evident and the provision within the scheme will accord with this identified need. In terms of the quality of the proposed accommodation, all proposed dwellings will meet the minimum required space standards and will provide private amenity space as required by the London plan. The dwellings will be at least dual aspect and the submitted daylight and sunlight assessment indicates sufficient levels of daylight and sunlight standards. In summary, the dwelling mix and quality accommodation is supported. I will now turn to the assessment of the design of the proposal. As part of the assessment of the application, the council's design team were consulted. The proposal was considered to be of high quality design and an appropriate scale for its urban setting. It should be noted that the design of the scheme has benefited from engagement with design officers during the pre-application process. A number of amendments were made during the course of the application in line with design officer recommendations. This included changing the layout of unit line to allow for direct access to amenity space. The delivery of a proposal which exhibits high quality materials is of key importance and this has been secured by planning condition. Details regarding the balustrade and specification of doors have also been secured by planning conditions. 
The scheme has been revised in line with comments made by Secure by Design officers and changes have included the mission of external roof ladder access. In summary, the design of the proposed development is supported subject to conditions. It is of the highest importance that any proposal has an acceptable impact on neighbouring immunity. Key areas of assessment on this application were impact on daylight and sunlight, outlook, privacy and noise and disturbance. It has been identified that the proposal, by reason of the delivery of a five-storey building on an undeveloped site, will have an impact on daylight and sunlight of neighbouring properties. A submitted dirt and sunlight assessment identifies the level of impact, which will be particularly noticeable to blocks 3 to 23 Sutton Road, and that is the odd numbers. Officers would like to draw members' attention to pages 88 to 92 of the report, which summarises the impact, and some further updates to the dirt and sunlight assessment section are outlined in the officer update. Although officers acknowledge that there will be a noticeable impact on neighbouring properties, it is also accepted that the impact is exacerbated by the presence of architectural features on neighbouring buildings which inhibit light, including overhanging walkways and projecting eaves, as exhibited on 38 to 66 Croydon Road, and projecting balconies and porches, which are present on 3 to 23 Sutton Road. As the existing site is undeveloped, the neighbouring properties will have uncharacteristically high levels of dinners and consequently larger percentage reductions once the development is in place. By reason of the nature of the site in an urban setting, the presence of architectural features and neighbouring properties which inhibit light and the level of impact identified as part of the daylight sunlight assessment, on balance, although the proposal will have a notable impact to daylight sunlight, this level of impact is not considered to be unacceptable. In the separation distances between the proposed buildings and the neighbouring properties retains an acceptable level of privacy in this urban setting. By reason of these separation distances between the proposed building and the neighbouring occupiers, the proposal will not result in a harmful level of loss of outlook. Although the proposal will result in the intensification of the use of the site, officers are satisfied that the patterns of comings and goings will not result in harmful levels of noise and disturbance. At the recommendation of London Borough of Newham Environmental Health Officers, a control of dust and emissions condition has been attached. In summary, the impacts on neighbouring amenities are considered to be acceptable. Turning now to matters of sustainable transportation. The site has a modest PTAL of three. Transport assessment identifies parking stress of 68% and local car ownership of half of, the, half of the vehicle per household. The application is proposing a car free development with exception of blue badge holders secured via a unilateral undertaking. Given that the parking stress and a car ownership levels, the proposal will not have an unacceptable impact on parking or traffic. A car club facility has been secured by unilateral undertaking. 56 cycle parking spaces are proposed and this exceeds the draft London plan standard. Details of cycle store are secured by a planning condition. The reinstatement of crossovers and delivery of blue badge parking spaces are secured by unilateral undertaking. A construction logistics plan has been secured by pre-commencement condition. In summary, the proposal is acceptable in terms of its impact on transportation subject to conditions and unilateral undertaking. Other material considerations relevant to this application are waste management, sustainable development, biodiversity and sustainable urban drainage, and habitat regulation assessment. The proposed development with respect to all the above matters is supported as detailed on pages 95 to 99 of the committee report and in the officer's update. The local development committee is asked to resolve to agree the reasons for approval as set out in this report and delegate authority to the director of planning and development to grant planning permission subject to the completion of a legal agreement under section 106 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990 as amended, based on the heads of terms identified at appendix 10 of the support and the conditions listed in appendix nine of the support. 
This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Thank you. Can we go back to the full screen, please? Certainly. Thank you. Any members? Councillor Mughal? Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to ask this question from Officer. Uh, they mentioned that this is uh, affordable rent, 100%. Mm -hmm. well, I can't see anything there that says that how how many dwellings are basically at social rent level. And there is another question associated to this. They say that 38% are the family houses. And what's the percentage of the social houses in this 38%? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor, for your question. 100% um, of the um, units are proposed to be provided at London affordable rent. Um, and that means all the family um, houses provided, uh, units provided, will be provided at London affordable rent. So that, that means you are saying there is not a single dwelling uh, at social rent level, yeah? Um, they are provided at uh, London affordable rent levels. There is no social rent level. This is exactly what I'm asking. Is that the uh, answer? There is no single social dwelling in this uh, project. Is that correct? Um, not at social rent, it's at private London affordable rent level, which we consider to be a, a satisfactory affordable housing product. So was there any special reason that we uh, didn't ask them for the social rent level properties? Um, we've been uh, working liaison with London Borough of New and Regeneration team, and it is from their evidence that this is a, a a level of affordable housing product, which is in high demand by the um, by the people of the London Borough of Newham. Uh, Chair, uh, just to, you know, the affordable rent is up to 80% of the market rent. So you know that we have the uh, poverty rate in the Newham. We need more social housing for that. People are on the low income. So that's why I think we need to just focus on this, that we need to have as much as the social rent level housing and that should be, I mean, us as a council asking the developers. They need to just take into consideration that. Thank you. Thank you. Council Griffiths. Um, yes, just one small thing, Ms. Beatty. I'm reading through this lengthy thing we've been sent as a supplementary. I'd just like you to assure us all so that everybody can hear it, that the Environment Agency's concerns about flooding assessment have been incorporated in the conditions. Um, absolutely. Thank you for your right, um, right. question, Councillor. They have been accommodated. We have a pre-commencement condition which has been attached uh, to this application. It means that no development can commence on site until a flood risk assessment has been prepared in line with the um, Environment Agency's requirements. Um, we will consult the Environment Agency as part of the assessment of that condition and development right, right. cannot start until that has right. been provided. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gray. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to add a little bit to Council, Councillor Mogul, really important point about the need for more genuinely affordable homes. The London affordable rent is um, the new social rent in London. It is slightly more expensive than a traditional social rent. Uh, somebody described it as social rent plus a five pound a week. Um, which is uh, back of a fag packet sort of a comment. But um, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, we need more truly affordable rents in Newham to tackle the awful housing poverty. But the London affordable rent is a, a akin to a social rent and also enable us to get a little bit extra money to increase the total supply of truly affordable homes. Great. Thank you, Councillor Gray. Um, just a note to the officers then, when we do come up with other additional planning applications that come through, that, that the social rent levels are actually uh, reviewed as such that the council members are happy with. Might I just make one more comment, Chair? Um, just in terms of the affordable housing, um, this um, was viability tested as well. 
and it was found to provide the maximum amount of affordable housing that we provided. I understand that the um, applicant has asked to speak as part of this application. I'm sure they'll be able to provide some further detail as to why the why they have sought London affordable rent in the scheme and explain it as part of the mayor's uh, affordable housing delivery plan as well. Thank you. Do we have any further questions? We do have the um, project manager from New Generations yes. here. Uh, Andrea, Chair, can, I, can I make a quick hello. comment on this? Sorry? Can I make a quick, quick comment, Chair? I was going to move on to the officers that were present, Councillor Mugul. Maybe you can come back after we've uh, heard uh, from the applicant if there's anything else we need to add. Okay, that's fine. Andrea? Um, Yes, just to quickly address the question of the London Affordable Rent. Yes, this is um, the uh, Affordable Homes for Newham programme uh, of, of which this application forms part of. Um, it does generally, uh, for all affordable units for rent, it, it applies the London Affordable Rent. And to my knowledge, this is a, a sort of a banded rent. And um, I believe that it is actually less than 8% of market rent. Um, in, in terms of the, the level of rent. And um, our planning consultant, uh, Francis Young, um, had, has sort of prepared a, a, a few more points, um, but I think most of our, our points have been covered now, actually. Francis, can I pass over to you? Thanks, Andrea. And um, we just wanted to run through some of the points um, in about the project. So good evening. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Regeneration Services, who are the applicants for the proposed housing scheme at 34 to 36 Sutton Road. This scheme is being brought forward as part of the Council's Affordable Home Programme, which was approved by Cabinet in July 2019 and aims to start building a thousand new council homes for rent by 2022 in order to tackle the Council's housing waiting list, which currently stands at over 27,000 people. The programme will deliver the development of vacant and underused council-owned sites for high quality, sustainable, low carbon, affordable homes. The scheme at Sutton Road is for a five story block of flats, which will provide 29 affordable homes at London affordable rent, a mix of one, two and three bed units and associated landscaping and cycle parking. 38% of the homes will be for families. The scheme is on council owned land and will make an important contribution to the borough's much needed affordable housing requirement. As Harriet has mentioned, the buildings previously on the site were used by the Amber Project as a family centre up to 2016, when the project relocated to elsewhere in the borough. Safety concerns, however, were identified and the buildings were demolished in December 2020 under a prior approval for demolition consent. All of the new units meet the required space standards and have private amenity space in the form of outdoor patios or balconies, and the scheme incorporates landscape enhancements and a communal garden with play space for children under five. <clears throat> the scheme has evolved as a result of pre-planning, consultation with both local residents and new and planners. In addition, the proposed scheme has been amended to address issues raised by the Secure by Design team. The scheme is car free, except for three on-site, on-street disabled parking spaces, which means that residents will not be able to apply for parking permits. However, residents will be provided with membership of, local, of a local car club. 56 cycle parking spaces are proposed in line with London plan requirements. Officers have confirmed that there will be no adverse impact on highways. The housing delivery team undertook door knocking exercises in February and March 2020, ran a creative workshop in March and an online public consultation in June of this year in order to engage local residents on the design process. The key issue I raised was the potential impact of the scheme on existing parking, and this has been addressed through a parking permit restriction in the unilateral undertaking. The scheme has been through an extensive iterative process to ensure that the site is optimised in line with the aspirations for the scheme, but also to minimise the level of impact to the daylight and sunlight immunity of neighbouring properties. It is relevant that the existing site condition is vacant and any former buildings were low rise. In such cases, properties surrounding the site will currently enjoy very high levels of daylight and sunlight immunity, which isn't characterized, um, which isn't characteristic of an urban environment in London. So in establishing what we consider to be an appropriate daylight target value, we have been guided by decisions made by the GLA and the planning inspectorate 
on similar urban sites in London. The daylight and sunlight levels within neighbouring properties in the proposed scenario are reflective of what has been considered appropriate on comparable air sites in urban areas across London. The project team has worked closely to ensure that the impacts are minimised as far as possible. We acknowledge that there are breaches to BRE guidelines. However, we consider that the residual level of daylight and sunlight immunity is acceptable, specifically when considering the urban context of this site. We do not consider that the scheme gives rise to unacceptable harm. Hello, Officers have, on you. you have 30 seconds left. Officers have confirmed that on balance, the significant benefits of the proposal outweigh any daylight and sunlight impacts, that the scheme is of an appropriate scale and will deliver a high quality, affordable housing scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any members? No? Councillor Muggle, did you want to come back? I'm, I do apologise. Uh, thank you, Chair. That's fine. Chair, uh, if you look into the local development plan, it clearly says that council has the responsibility to pursue for at least 50% of the uh, social housing. So it variates between 35 to 50%. Uh, I, I cannot support any of the project where there is a no single social dwelling in this 29. I mean, this uh, this is, as a councillor, is our responsibility to take look, uh, take care of this and look into in the best interest of the local communities who likely below the poverty line and there is a uh, extreme need of the housing. And we need the social housing to just bridge up that uh, gap between the uh, 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 less well of people and who are who lives below the average uh, income and who are unemployed, you know, the poverty level in the new M. We need to focus on this. I will ask all my colleagues to just consider it. If we are going to approve this one, is affordable rent. It, this will leave on the discretion of the developers if they want to charge up to the 80%, it says. There is no benchmark. There is nothing in the plan uh, so far I can see. So they can just charge up to the 80%. They can charge 80% rent. Whereas the social rent, which is far below than the 50% of the rent, that's what we require for our communities in the new home. So that's why I want to just contribute. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other members? No. Okay. Could we go to the recommendation that's on, on the... Uh, agenda papers. I understand your feeling, Councillor Muggle, and I'm sure that uh, uh, officers will brief up the the applicant uh, and future applications accordingly. Thank you. Um, can I go to the move to the vote then, members? Yep. All those members in favour of the uh, recommendation. Shelley, did you manage to count? Chair, I think there's five. Sorry, I'm going to have to clear this the screen sharing because it, um, okay, it's easier. But yeah, I think there's five. If you can all keep your hands up, I can double check. <clears throat> Six. Thank you very much. Uh, any members um, abstaining? Excuse me, um, Chair. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, I'm abstaining, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Khan, are you abstaining? Yes, I am. Okay. Can you note that, uh, Joy, please? We'll, we'll do, yeah. Sorry, was that Jane? Yeah, that was, uh, sorry, that was, that was uh, uh, me, Jane, Chair. I think perhaps we could come back with um, an explanation of the different affordable housing products and um, how that squares with the current local plan um, policies, which um, hopefully members would find useful for future applications. Okay, thank you, General. I think that'll be really Chair, Chair sorry, I, I want to intervene here. There is a clear cut understanding in the local development plan. There must be a social rent level dwellings in any of the project. I'm not against affordable rent, but there should be a percentage in every project that should be social rent level housing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can, can I go back to Jane and say thank you, Jane, for uh, offering that uh, uh, advice to us. And moving forward, I would say in future, if we could have a short session, maybe prior to the meeting, or when we are looking at the, the, the protocols, it could be uh, linked in with that. 
we could take it to the development control members forum because it is quite a difficult um, area because there are so many different affordable products on the market mm. at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just, for, uh, just for record, the application for uh, 34 to 36 Sutton Road has been approved by unanimously by the members. No. Got that right? No. Thank you very much. Can we move on to item eight, which is land between 2A and yeah. 2A Clinton? Yeah, but the uh, on that. Chair, Obtention. sorry, just to clarify that on that last item, um, it was 6 4 and two abstentions. That's right, yes. Sorry. Okay, we're happy with that. That was approved. 6 4 and two abstentions. Thank you, just for clarification. So can we move on to item eight then, please? I know we have one objector, Mr. Patel. Is he with us? He is. Miss Patel, I'm here. Yes, oh, I do apologize. I do apologize, Miss Patel. Okay, could we have the officer's report, please, first? Uh, yes, Chair, I would also like it known that the um, applicant's agent is registered to speak and has also right, yes. uh, got a presentation ready. So I will share my screen now. Can everyone see my screen? Good evening, Chair. Good evening, members, ladies and gentlemen. This is the application for the land between 2 and 2A Clinton Road in Forest Gate. This image shows the existing site outlined in yellow. Neighbouring the site um, to the east is an existing vehicle repair garage. Also outlined in blue, uh, you can see Forest Gate uh, Community Youth Centre, which is located across the road from the site. This application seeks permission for the demolition of an existing temporary building on site and the development of a four storey mixed use scheme comprising of seven residential units on the first, second and third floors with new community use at ground floor with cycle parking, refuse and recycle storage and associated works. Back around to the application and site. A previous application for the site was supported by the local development committee in March and was approved in June following the completion of a section 106 legal agreement. The primary difference between this application and the previous permission is the addition of a, an, another floor to provide an additional residential unit. The application site is owned by the East London Black Women's Organisation and has been owned by them since the 1980s after it was gifted the land by the Greater London Council. The organisation offers many services to its user base, including counselling, domestic violence support, before and after school clubs, drop and advice services, support classes, youth leadership and intervention programmes, tuition classes, a women's support group and other general, general charitable services. The land previously comprised of a Victorian church hall with which the organisation used for such services. Permission was granted in 2000 for an extension uh, so the organisation could improve its facilities. However, fire in the mid 2000s destroyed the original church hall and the extension, leaving the organisation homeless. In the intervening years, the organisation has rented space within uh, within various facilities in and around Forest Gate. However, such arrangement has placed a financial strain on the organisation and has limited the effective operation that this, of services that they can offer. The organisation has now entered into an agreement with the applicant for the funding and redevelopment of the site to provide a new purpose-built facility, ensuring the financial viability of the organisation on their land, with the organisation's services consolidated back into one location. The proposed residential units will assist in facilitating such a move. Purpose of this committee item. 
This application was previously presented to members of lo the Local Development Committee on the 26th of October 2020. The application was recommended for approval by officers. However, following the presentation of uh, the item by officer and upon hearing from a, na a neighbouring objector from 50 Bignold Road, the committee resolved to defer the application until such time that a further study of the daylight and sunlight impacts of the development as a whole could be provided. Such study was received by the council on the 2nd of November 2020. Following such receipt, a reconsultation on the application was undertaken. An additional objection comment was received from 50 Bignold Road, as well as a further letter from the independent consultant. Officers acknowledged the further comments received in this regard. The results of this updated daylight and sunlight analysis have been discussed within the impacts to neighbouring immunity section of the committee report and will be addressed within this presentation. These images show the existing site and its surroundings. This is the existing northern front elevation of the site. This is looking east from the site. And this is looking west from the site. This is a CGI image of the proposed front elevation. It is important to note that the main brick part of the building at the lower three levels is effectively what was approved under the previous application. This proposal seeks an alternative scheme, including the addition of that of a, an additional third floor for, to provide an additional residential unit compared to the approved scheme. This is a 3D model of the proposed massing of the development within its surroundings as taken within the daylight and as taken from the daylight and sunlight study provided. These are the proposed front and rear elevations. And these are the proposed side elevations. Principle of development, community facility use. The principle of mixed community facility and residential development has previously been accepted by the, via the existing approved permission. Notwithstanding, I shall still go through the key considerations as follows. Whilst the pre-existing use of the site as a community facility is acknowledged, Prowling policy dictates that careful consideration must be given to the management of the delivery of community uses, including in cases of reprovision or redevelopment. In particular, policy INF8 of the local plan has specific regard to the growth and management of provision and reprovision of community facilities. In relation to the requirements of this policy and other relevant policies, the following assessment is provided. Firstly, the proposal would comprise of a high quality, full redevelopment of the whole site, avoiding piecemeal development. Whilst the lawful use of the site is as a community facility, the site is located outside of a de designated identified town centre, local centre or community facility opportunity area and the community facility would provide 210 metres of floor space with indicated 15 to 20 users on site at any one time. It is acknowledged that policy INF8 dictates the town centre first approach. However, in this instance, officer portion weight to the circumstances which caused the charity to move away from the site following the fire. To further support the case, the applicant did provide a sequential test under the context of the previous application, demonstrating that there were no suitable sites that would meet the needs of the organisation with a town centre, local centre or community facility opportunity area. Furthermore, it is acknowledged that the site is located across the road from Forest Gate Youth and Community Centre, an existing centre owned and run by the council. The existing service centre services include a youth club, which provides services and activities for young people and an adult education centre. Officers consider that services proposed to be offered at the application site would successfully link and complement the services off offered at this adjacent centre, facilitating a recognisable hub or cluster in line with policy INF8. The services proposed to be offered at the application site include various women's support services, including domestic violence support, childcare, including the nursery, before and after school clubs, youth projects, uh, tuition and training programmes and counselling services. The application also has successfully evidenced a local need for the facility, with 89.5% of users located within Newham, significantly above the 67% required by policy. Of these users, 77% are from Forest Gate. The facility would have a well-designed frontage with legible entrance and would 
have space available for use by other community groups. A condition is recommended requiring a community facility management plan be submitted and approved by the council prior to occupation. Some matters that the, this plan will require to detail are the arrangements to, to secure inclusive use of the facility for members of the community, management arrangements, and a system for making complaints to management. Overall, having regards to the key policy considerations discussed, the proposed redevelopment of the site to again cater for the existing organisation is supported in principle. Principle of development, residential. London plan and local plan policies identify a pressing need for more homes catering to local need. The site is primarily in a residential area and is not allocated for any specific land use. The delivery of residential units on this site will positively contribute to the borough's housing stock, noting the demand for increased housing. Furthermore, it is noted that the local plan and London plan recognises the importance of mixed-use development in achieving good growth across the borough. In this regard, the proposed mix of community and residential uses on site are considered compatible and viable uses for the site. Dwelling mix and quality of accommodation. With respect to dwelling mix, the proposed development will seek to provide three three-bedroom units and four one-bedroom units. It is considered that such arrangement, noting the incorporation of three family-sized units, constitutes a suitable mix reflecting local need. All of the proposed units would meet minimum space standards and private amenity space requirements as stipulated by the London Plan and Housing SVG, and would be dual or triple aspect with a good outlook and natural light. All units will be accessed via communal entrance lobby separate to the community facility, providing high quality, safe and legible entrance. Officers acknowledge that the proposed community facility and nearby railway line has the potential to cause some noise and disturbance for the occupiers of the residential units. As such, various conditions are recommended to mitigate such impacts. Therefore, subject to the recommended conditions, the quality of accommodation is supported. Urban design and placemaking. Officers are satisfied that the fenestration and form of the development will be of a high quality contributing to the surrounding setting in a positive way. The contemporary design of the development, whilst differing in terms of architectural style from its surroundings, is considered to appropriately comp complement and integrate with this surrounding setting. The additional story proposed incorporates sufficient setbacks from the stories below so as to avoid this element looking overly dominant. Revisions to the application were sought during the application period to incorporate contrasting materials for the fourth story as to reduce the visual prominence of the building. Overall, officers are satisfied the development re represents a high quality that can be supported. Conditions have been recommended requiring further details for approval at later stages in relation to the material samples, architectural detailing, landscaping and boundary treatments to ensure the highest quality finish in all aspects. Impacts on neighbouring amenity, daylight slash sunlight. The London Housing SBG and Local Plan Policy SB8 refer to the use of BRE guidelines in assessing the impacts of developments in terms of daylight and sunlight. The MPPF states that when assessing applications for housing, authorities should take a flexible approach to the use of BRE guidelines. Following the previous decision of the committee to defer this application, a revised daylight and sunlight assessment produced by Waldrons was provided and a subsequent week consultation was undertaken. The submitted daylight and sunlight assessment analyses the impacts of the surrounding residential properties on Clinton Road, Bignold Road and Dames Road compared to the existing context. The building, whilst at four storeys of overall height, has a part step formation to the rear and slight setbacks as to assist in the mitigation of uh, the loss of light for neighbouring properties. The fourth story proposed would be further set back from uh, the floors below as to further um, mitigate such impacts. It's important to note that BRE guidelines are based on a low density suburban housing model and it's generally acknowledged that within denser London urban environments such as this, a flexible approach should be uh, applied to indicative appropriate figures. The BRE guidelines comprise of three different component tests. The vertical sky component, VSC test, no skyline or NSL slash NSC test and the animal probable sunlight hours, APSH test. Full details of how such tests are calculated can be found within the committee report. Impacts on daylight and sunlight, Bignold Road properties. 
This image shows the application site and the properties tested within the updated daylight and satellite analysis on Bignold Road outlined in green. As can be seen from such images, the properties on Bignold Road to the north primarily consist on, of two-storey residential terrace properties. Officers also draw further attention to the position of Bignold Road to the rear of the application site. Big, 50 Bignold Road here is outlined in green. Officers acknowledge the comments received from the, the occupiers of 50 Bignold Road. In relation to 50 Bignold Road, 10 windows are analysed. Six windows would still retain a vertical sky component, BSC, of at least 27%. All other windows are considered to be below 27% as existing. Three of these windows would experience a reduction of no less than 0.9 times their former value and thus comply with the relevant guidelines. The remaining window experiencing a loss of VSE already has a limited level of light due to an existing overhang. In terms of the NSC test, nine windows will be unaffected. One window affected is, is one which already suffers from a projecting a reduced level of light due to a projecting roof overhang. This window has been assessed with an existing NSC of 66.84, which will be reduced to 51.48, thus reduced to 0.77 times its full, uh, former value. For the AS, APSH test, according to the findings, findings, all windows currently receive sunlight that will retain annual public or sunlight hours as well in excess of the minimum 25% considered appropriate as minimum as well as an excess of the minimum 5% for winter. The one window substantively impacted by the existing roof overhang has been calculated as zero existing uh, sunlight annual percentage and thus would remain uh, as such regardless of this proposal. With respect to sunlight, the findings demonstrate the windows reduced by no less than 0.8 times, 88 times their former value. Whilst the existing the overhang is disputed, as detailed within the comments received, any reduction in terms of light to the windows within the overhang, should this overhang not exist, will be similar to other ground floor windows along this terrace of Bignold Road, where the loss was found to be in accordance with the BRE guidelines. As such, officers considered the impacts to the, uh, these occupiers of 50 Bignold Road would be acceptable and balanced. Any impacts to the other properties of Bignold Road would fall within the BRE guidelines or experience no notable reduction compared to the existing arrangement as detailed within the committee report. Clinton Road properties. Similarly, the Clinton, properties on Clinton Road consist of a terrace of three two-storey dwelling houses to the east of the site and an existing commercial memo T garage to a Clinton Road to the west of the site. In terms of to Clinton Road, whilst the report would indicate reductions beyond the BRE guidelines, it is considered that this property would experience a loss in the case of any meaningful development at the application site of any number of stories. It is therefore considered that this loss would be justified as to protect this property for any loss of light would significantly prejudice the site from optimising its development potential, even at a much, much lesser scale than that proposed. It was not necessary to test for Clinton Road, noting that none of the uh, windows of this property orientate towards the application site. In respect of 6 Clinton Road, only three windows were determined to be affected and such impact was found to be negligible with any reduction less than 0.8 times their existing former value. For 2A Clinton Road, the garage, any such impacts in the site are acceptable, noting that uh, such impact will only, will only be greater than existing for, the portion of the, for a portion of the day and being self-facing, this garage will still experience good levels of sunlight for a high proportion of the day. It is not considered the loss of light would be pose a particular detriment to the continued, se continued successful operation of this business. Dames Road properties. The properties on Dames Road consist of two-storey terraced dwelling houses. Many of the properties on Dames Road already experience a VSC of less than 27%. Any further reductions, however, have been identified as being no less than 0.8 times their former values. 
no windows will be reduced to 0.8 times their former values in respect of NSC or NSL considerations. Reductions in APSH for these uh, properties are primarily uh, in respect of windows that experience low levels of light within winter months currently. The existing conservatory extension at 25 Dames Road also somewhat distorts the values for this property. In terms of sunlight to all surrounding gardens for all properties uh, surrounding the site, the reduction in sunlight to all surrounding rear gardens will meet the target values as set out within the guidelines. Conclusion. Whilst there will be inevitably a loss, be a loss of daylight and sunlight to varying degrees and times for surrounding properties, such loss is insubstantial with surrounding properties still receiving an overall sufficient level of daylight and sunlight. Officers are therefore satisfied that the loss of light to surrounding properties would not be unacceptably harmful to the living conditions of surrounding occupants. Privacy outlook and overbearing impacts. The existing permission has effectively set a precedent for accepting the main part of the building. In terms of loss of outlook and increased overbearing for the neighbouring residential properties, such impacts are not considered to be substantial given the step massings and setbacks in relation to such neighbouring residential buildings. The proposed development may appear overbearing for the garage at 2A Clinton Road, noting the flank wall and the eastern elevation of the building which would protrude further forward of the garage. However, such impact is not considered unacceptable, noting the nature of the use of this adjacent site. Furthermore, officers are satisfied that the development is designed not to unduly prejudice the future development potential of this neighbouring site. There will inevitably be additional outlook and loss of privacy over the rear of gardens of the surrounding properties. Such impact is considered acceptable, accounting for the existing context of the surrounding environment, whereby terrace properties, not by their very nature, overlook and oppose one another. In seeking to, to minimise and avoid privacy conflicts, the design includes sawtooth windows as pictured on the western side elevation, restricting direct outlook over to Clinton Road and providing limited outlook to neighbouring properties to the rear. Secondly, the design of the railings of the rear windows and balconies have been designed in a style which minimises the amount of through looking. The additional story, by reason of its decent setbacks from the main rear elevation, will minimise the sense of overbearing and mitigate any potential privacy conflicts to an acceptable degree. Impact on neighbouring immunity, noise and disturbance. There will inevitably be some increased noise and disturbance as a result of the increased comings and goings from the site and the uses proposed. The proposal is seeking one additional unit to what is already approved is not considered to give rise to any potential additional harm in terms of noise and disturbance, particularly noting its upper level in set in sighting and orientation um, of the main external amenity area towards the highway. Any noise and disturbance arising for the residential use of the site is anticipated to be typical of residential type activities, acceptable in the context of the surrounding environment, which is primarily residential in nature. With respect to the proposed community facility, waste is a portion to the previous use of the site and potential noise and disturbance that could arise from activities undertaken if such facility were not still in situ. It is noted that this community facility operation would not be dissimilar to that previous and conditions of this permission would be able to appropriately control the noise and disturbance that could arise. Conditions have therefore been recommended to control the impact such as limits on amplified music, hours of operation for the community facility, sound insulation and the development of community facility management and uh, the providing of a demolition and construction management plan. Overall, the proposed development is considered acceptable in terms of impacts on neighbouring immunity, subject to the conditions recommended. Sustainable transport. The site has a PTAL rating of three, representing a moderate access to public transport and is located in, within a controlled parking zone. The development is designed as car free and will be accompanied by a travel plan demonstrating management strategies for encouraging users uh, of the facility to utilise sustainable transport means for accessing the site, reducing the reliance on car travel. New and transportation officers have reviewed the strategy under the context of the previous application and considered the measures to be appropriate. A park and stress survey was submitted with the previous application, indicating high levels of stress within this area. Due to this, 
to ensure there is no burden of, upon such stress, new transportation officers previously recommended restrictions on the ability of individuals to apply for residential and business parking permits for the site. It is considered that a restriction on parking permits and implementation and monitoring of the travel plan should be secured by way of a Section 1 agreement section 106 agreement and condition as per the previous application for this site. It is also noted that this uh, site has an existing vehicle crossover. Such crossover is proposed to be removed as part of this application. The roof removal works have the possibility to allow for the extension of an existing parking bay on Clinton Road to allow for additional on-street parking to the benefit of the community. These highway works shall be secured through the section 106 agreements. Further conditions are recommended in relation to, to the securing of cycle parking facilities, the delivery and servicing arrangements and a construction and demolition management plan. Subject to the imposition of the recommended uh, conditions in Section 106 heads of terms, planning and transportation officers are satisfied that development will not result in any adverse impact on the safe and efficient operation of the highways. The proposed development is thus considered acceptable in terms of transportation. Other considerations. As outlined within the committee report, the matters in relation to waste management, delivering sustainable development, land contamination, the habitat regulation assessment have been addressed within this, uh, this application and are supported, as detailed within page 157 to 160 of the committee report. The local uh, development committee is therefore asked to resolve to agree the reasons for approval as set out in the committee report and delegate authority to the director of planning and development to grant planning permission subject to the completion of a legal agreement under section 106 of the town and country planning act 1990 as amended based on the heads of terms listed at appendix 10 of the committee report and the conditions listed at appendix 9 of the committee report thank you thank you any members got any questions? Councillor Gray? Yeah, actually, Chair, I'll, I'll wait until um, the objector speaks, then I, I will raise my question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there's no questions to the uh, agent as well, can we move on to the objector? Uh, Ms. Hafisa Patel, I'm sorry I did say Mr. Um, can, that's fine. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. Can I just remind you you have five minutes? And oh, then I'll remind you. you. Yeah. Um, you so I first want to thank all the councillors um, for requesting the light report in the previous meeting and thank the developers for submitting it so quickly. I think it was done within five working days, which is amazing. Now I don't have links to construction or planning, so please bear with me. I'm gonna try and be as clear and concise as possible. So my reason for requesting the report was to see the full light impact um, on our house. Um, and the wording of the report and analysis makes a lot of assumptions um, and insists on comparing a three story versus a four story, which is what they've currently been approved versus what they're applying for. But please note that in the previous application, no such report was submitted. So we had no BRE guidelines or numbers in the previous application. So I couldn't make these points in the previous application. Um, and do correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought each application was um, should be treated independently, regardless of what's been approved previously. So we should be looking at what currently exists, which is a one story versus what they're proposing to build, which is a four story. Now, bearing in that in mind, I reviewed the report and focused on the table and the details provided um, and the levels of change. So current light levels and new light levels. Now, um, BRE guidelines suggest 20% loss is appropriate um, with flexibility as Helen mentioned. Um, however, from the table, it points out that we lose light of 53% in one of our windows. Um, now, we understand flexibility, so for 20% guidelines, 30, 40, but 53% is basically not following the guidelines whatsoever. Um, also, because I'm not a professional, we had an independent surveyor review the report, um, and they've actually written a letter which I've requested to be read out, specifically focusing probably on the last paragraph. Um, and I'm also going to point you to your point out to the PAC, where in 1.85, I think, um, there's clear acknowledgement that this proposal actually has a negative impact on more than just my household it impacts like other residents gardens as well. 
Now, um, from my understanding, I thought a new proposal should be looking to fit into its surroundings rather than requesting the surroundings sort of amend itself. So, um, they so the the new building should be fitting in rather than impacting us substantially. But that doesn't feel like it's the case here. Now, further to this, I've, I've kind of reviewed the comments and suggestions about justifying um, the proposal to potentially for it to be okay if the overhang sort of maybe didn't exist in, in my home. But the reality is we've lived here for years and the house was designed before we even moved in. There's no changes being made from us. We don't have the funds to amend our home to actually make this more appropriate. The developers haven't suggested that they would fund any changes to our home. So to justify the loss of light for this new building by saying the design of our home is slightly inappropriate seems just not consider or not appropriate. So I'm just gonna go back to my key point. So if we're just following the guidelines that Newham say they're setting out, so these are the BRE guidelines, 20% loss is okay. This is 53% loss. Um, and I have only just found this out when this report was submitted. So the previous application didn't highlight this whatsoever. Um, so I think given that, and the fact that the, the applicant probably has a means and ability to amend this so that the separation distance is more or um, that our light isn't impacted so much. I think we should reconsider and maybe request them to amend their proposal. That's it from me. Thank you. I think you're on mute. I'm just done reading this. Thank you, Hafisa. I appreciate your comments. Uh, any questions? Councillor Gray? Well, it's, it's a question to officers, really. I've read the letter and I've listened to the officer's report and they have um, sort of addressed the issue, uh, but can they respond specifically to the letter and to obviously Mrs Patel's concerns? Sure, John. So we acknowledge the uh, letter and uh, a number of uh, assumptions are made generally when these um, assessments are undertaken. Uh, for example, uh, I believe the uh, ejector in their previous comments uh, stated that they, you know, they, they did not have any um, uh, room layouts for their property available. So how could we make a proper assessment? Uh, these, you know, we when uh, consultants are drawing up these daylight and sunlight assessments, they rely on the, pro the available, uh, publicly available records for layouts of properties, so rely planning records and estate agent records. However, as you may understand, this is not possible to be obtained for every property as such. Um, you know, assumptions have to be made, I think, with respect to the um, uses of those rooms and the impacts they could have. Um, but I think it may be best, uh, I understand that the applicant uh, has uh, requested their daylight and sunlight consultant to present a small presentation for committee. So it may be best um, that we hear from them and hear from uh, their expertise uh, and the findings that they came to in more detail before we uh, go into further details on this matter. Thank you. Yeah, hi there, I'm the uh, Daylight Sunlight Consultant for uh, Clinton Road. Uh, my name is Luke Wilson, I'm from Waldron, so I'm appointed by the applicant to undertake the Daylight Sunlight Analysis uh, for the proposed scheme in front of you this evening. Um, as mentioned, the scheme hasn't changed to you, hasn't changed uh, since the previous planning application discussed back in October. Um, as mentioned, the discussion then focused in part on the Daylight and Sunlight, uh, sunlight impact for neighbours, and particularly to 50 Big Nold Road. Um, the architect's also here tonight uh, for any questions, but I'm just going to speak through the uh, results of the analysis. Uh, particularly from the perspective of 50 Big Nob Road. Now, just for a bit of clarity, our analysis is based on an accurate 3D model of the site and surrounding area, uh, with windows and more rooms uh, added following site photography and internet mapping. Now, that's going to become a bit important later on. Um, it follows the methodology laid out in the BRE guidelines for daylight and sunlight, uh, and compared the change between the existing position on the site and the proposed position, as well as the change between the consented position and the current proposal. Now, just touching on the um, point of objection on um, comparison to the consent, the BRE guidelines for daylight and sunlight state in paragraph F2, that in assessing the loss of light to existing windows nearby, a local authority may allow the vertical sky component, that's the measurement for daylight to windows, for the permitted scheme to be used as alternative benchmarks. So it's therefore wholly appropriate for us to also include commentary on that comparison uh, between the June 2020 consent and the current proposal. 
Now, as summarised by the planning officer, the daylight and sunlight results um, between the consented and the proposed position uh, show no greater than a 4% change uh, from, from the consented positions, which is a very small change, in our opinion, negligible. When we're looking at the change between the existing and the proposed position, so looking at the, uh, the true position on site today, all the windows in the neighbouring properties in Dames Road and Bignold Road either experience less than a 20% reduction in daylight and meet the target value, or experience a very small reduction in daylight. Now, this one window um, that's been referred to by the objector um, as, as, as we understood overhung, but potentially not overhung, um, that was modelled on the basis of imagery on Google Maps, which as shown by the planning officer earlier in the presentation, it appeared that there was some sort of overhang at the rear of the building. And so a window has been inserted underneath that overhang to provide a worst case scenario. We'd like to put windows everywhere where there might be a loss of daylight, just to test how, how, uh, how impactful that scheme potentially is. So we put a position right underneath um, this potential overhang as we saw it and analyzed that window. Now that window is the one that shows this 53% reduction. It shows a 53% reduction predominantly because it has a very low existing level of daylight when we analyzed it in the existing position, less than 1% VSC. And as such, any small change of daylight is going to result in a large percentage reduction. Uh, that window, that test window underneath that awning, actually experiences the smallest absolute reduction in daylight out of all the windows at 50 Big Nord Road. It's just the fact that it has a very low level of daylight that causes this large reduction. Now, if that overhang wasn't there, um, as, as indicated by the objector, <clears throat> that window is going to ret retain a lot more daylight in the existing position, be a lot more like its neighbouring windows on the ground floor. And as shown by our, anal our analysis, those windows on the ground floor experience less than a 20% 20, 20 reduction between the existing and proposed positions and therefore meet the guidelines. So either way you look at it, whether there is overhang in place or there isn't, um, in our view, that impact is acceptable. It's either taking away a very small amount of daylight resulting in this large percentage of uh, reduction, or in fact, the overhang isn't there and the results are likely acceptable as indicated by the other ground floor windows. Now we've also looked at the, sun, the uh, impact to sunlight to the gardens, the neighboring properties and all of the surrounding properties retain at least 50% of their area being what the BRE guidelines describe as being well sunlit. Now that is the, uh, the test criteria. If a garden retains 50% of that area, it's considered to meet the target value. So all the neighboring uh, gardens meet that target value for sunlight amenity as well. So in summary, there is a small change between the consensus and proposed positions, but it's virtually negligible in our opinion. And when you're looking at the existing and proposed positions, the only window that infringes uh, the recommendations on either Dames or Bignold Road is this one test window that was put under the awning uh, for a worst case position. If that window is in fact not overhung, it's much more likely to meet the guidelines. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions Hello. to the applicant? Any questions to the objector? Councillor Muggle? Uh, thank you, Chair. First part of my question I was told in by Councillor Gray, but I'm just going to ask again the officer. Uh, have we responded to the objector uh, in black and white that um, the assessor's report submitted to us uh, was accredited and what was our response to that uh, report? Um, so I, following the receipt of the report, uh, which I believe we received uh, a few days after the previous committee, um, a full reconsultation was undertaken where we notified any objectors, not just the objector from 50 Bignall Road, but anyone else who had commented on the application, as well as any other neighbor, surrounding neighbouring properties, that the um, that the application was out for reconsultation, and we notified any objectors that the uh, day, new daylight and sunlight assessment had been received, so they could uh, refuse it, uh, so they could review it. Um, and then the the only comments that were received from that round of reconsultation were a further comment from uh, the occupier of 50 Bignall Road and a letter from their uh, con from their consultant, which I did include within the committee update uh, provided. Yeah. And we have actually, Hannah has actually emailed the um, objector back directly in advance of the committee. I don't think that's in relation to this, though. Okay. Councillor Gray, is your hand up again? Yeah, thank you, Chair. And I appreciate um, the fact that officers are still recommending acceptance tells me uh, one thing, but 
can can officers please advise members of the committee on the merits of otherwise to the objector's uh, letter from her technical expert? I assume that's in order. Just to clarify, we've, we have um, analysed the representation that was received by Ms Patel's um, like independent consultant um, and we are satisfied that the daylight and sunlight report that has been since submitted since the previous committee has provided a full and thorough enough analysis of the existing context compared to the proposed context to enable officers to be satisfied that the um, impacts, whilst we acknowledge that there will be a detrimental impact, particularly to that one window, which is already substantially kind of reduced um, if that overhang is in place, um, that detriment is not so harmful to the overall living conditions so as to warrant for officers to consider to warrant reason for refusal. Thank you. Just to clarify, I think the question is, have I received a response regarding the letter I've sent? I think that's what I'm understanding, which answer is no. So if, if it's in relation to the letter that I've sent from my independent surveyor, whilst it's part of the comments, yes, I haven't received a response from anyone as to, like, for that letter, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, I'm mindful of... Uh... The recommendation. Uh, are there any other proposals which we have? No. No, I think we have to, we have recommendation in, in uh, our committee pack and uh, I think we need to move to a vote then. I'll just get the recommendation on the screen. Good, please. We should all be able to see the recommendation now. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask members to move to a vote then on the recommendation? All those members in favour of the recommendation do approve. Joy, have you managed to count the members? I believe that's seven, Chair. Thank you. Any abstentions? Any against? No, thank you very much. That has been approved. Item eight, two and two at Clinton Road, Forest Gate has been approved. Thank you very much. And can I just thank the objector again, her visa to have to come along today um, to join us in the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, item nine, uh, rear off 143 to 147 Barking Road. And I know Councillor Easter is speaking on behalf of the objectors as well. So she won't be taking part in the meeting other than objecting. Thank you very much. Uh, um, and thank uh, you. Uh, Abigail is going to be representing this report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members and members of the public. The application I'm presenting today is the land to the rear of 143 to 147 Barking Road. The application site is highlighted in red. The application site is at the rear of 143 to 147 Barking Road. 143 to 147 Barking Road is located in the designated Canning Town District Centre and comprises three sets of mid-terrace buildings along a terrace which is comprised of commercial units at ground floor level and residential units at first floor level. At the rear of these units, there is an existing vacant building known as Central Hall, 
which is the subject of the application proposal. Access to Central Hall is down an alleyway off of Hermit Road to the east, which links to Barking Road. The alley is sandwiched between the rear of Barking Road and Malmesbury Terrace. Central Hall is located approximately 85 metres down the alley. The, the site plan attached to the application indicates that the application site includes Central Hall and the entire alley at the rear of Barking Road. The application is seeking permission for the demolition of the existing property known as Central Hall and the erection of three three-bedroom terrace townhouses to the rear of 143 to 147 Barking Road with a height of three storeys with associated improvement works including resurfacing, drainage and lighting to the private service access road leading to the site. The proposed building will have a maximum height of 11.8 metres the front and rear of the building will be set in from the boundary line in order to facilitate front and rear gardens. Each property will have two balconies on the front elevation and a bike and bin storage in the front garden. The rear gardens will abut the rear of the properties on Barking Road. The units at the front of the site along Barking Road will be retained and are not considered as part of the above proposal. Um, the top image is the principal elevation fronting the alley to the north of the site and the bottom image depicts the rear southwards facing elevation opposite the rear of Barking Road Terrace. I will now discuss the key material planning considerations. The existing building on site is understood to be currently vacant. However, records indicate that the application site has previously been used as a bar. As the application site is located in a town centre, the retention of a commercial unit at the application site could be supported in principle. However, as the proposed development is for residential units, then the local plan states that a mix of commercial and residential units are important to create a vibrant town centre. Furthermore, noting the existing building is segregated from the primary commercial units fronting the main high street and is accessible only via the alleyway, which is not established for active town centre use. The proposed change of use, while resulting in the loss of possible employment floor space, is considered on balance acceptable in principle having regard to the merits of additional housing in the area. As such, the principle of providing residential accommodation at this site is supported. Housing offer. The site has a density of 250 habitable rooms per hectare. Officers consider this acceptable as it meets the requirements of the London plan. All units within the development would meet the minimum space standards as set out by the London plan. Dwellings will have a dual aspect and receive sufficient daylight and sunlight. The separation distance between the rear of the commercial and residential units on Barking Road from the rear of the proposed dwellings is approximately 9.6 metres. This will result in significant levels of overlooking and neighbouring properties being able to see directly into the windows on the rear elevation of the proposed dwellings. This would limit the level of privacy that the residents of the proposed development have access to and result in implications on the privacy of existing residents. Access to the proposed development is via an alley off of Hermit Road. The alley currently services the rear of the commercial units along Barking Road. The alleyway is highly littered, poor lit, poorly lit with uneven, unformed surfacing. The entrance to the alley does not provide an attractive, welcoming or legible entrance or approach um, for residential type use. The units are situated approximately 85 metres down the alley. Officers consider that the entrances will lack legibility and passive surveillance. Failing to secure, failing to provide a secure and attractive entry point to the rear residential units. Officers consider that the fear of crime discussed in the London plan and draft London plan has not been sufficiently addressed or considered. Overall, the poor quality access points together with the low level of privacy results in a poor standard of accommodation, which is considered unaccessible unacceptable. This constitutes a reason for refusal. Design and placemaking. Central Hall is a non-designated heritage site. It is considered that, that the historical and communal, communal significance of the site is important as it has connections to the Mansfield House University settlement. However, there are still multiple other buildings which represent the Mansfield House University settlement around Newark. These are, have much more historical and architectural merit. Furthermore, due to the limited access to the application site and that it can only be viewed from the alley, 
and the rear of the properties along Barking Road and Marlbury Terrace, coupled with the current state that the site has been left in, means that officers would not object to the demolition of the building for the replacement of a high quality development. Notwithstanding the above, the proposed building by reason of its bulky and dominant design in the existing built context fails to respect the character of the wider built environment. The building has a poor quality design which lacks quality, relief, interest and detailing, which fails to assimilate with or innovatively contrast with the surrounding setting. The proposed development has not been considered holistically and the development is disjointed in the context of the surroundings with a poor relationship with the public realm alleyway dominated by bin and bike stores. The design of the development is therefore considered to respond poorly to and fail to effectively integrate with the local context. The design of the development is not supported and constitute a reason for refusal. Um, the impacts to neighboring amenity. 52 neighboring properties were consulted, 12 objections were received. The key issues raised were the reduction in sunlight and daylight, the loss of privacy, the increase in noise and disturbance, um, public safety and transportation, and the loss of a community space. Some of the impacts of the proposed developments would be considered acceptable, and officers have justified these in re the report on page 208 to 209. To address the loss of sunlight and daylight, a BRI assessment has been submitted alongside the application, which demonstrates that any loss of sunlight and daylight would not cause detrimental impacts to the neighboring property. Properties. Sorry. The proposed development is considered to have a detrimental impact on the neighboring amenity of the properties to the rear of Milesman Terrace due to the balconies on the front elevation of the proposed development, giving rise to an unacceptable loss of privacy. Additionally, the proposed development is also in close proximity to the properties on 143 to 147 Barking Road. And the proposed development will give rise to an unacceptable loss of privacy to the upper residential units. For these reasons, officers consider the impact on neighboring properties as unacceptable. Um, sustainable transport. The application is proposing a car-free development. A car-free de development means that the residents of the development will not be able to apply for parking permits. Um, cycle provision has been provided, how, uh, however, officers would require additional information should the application be approved. The application is considered acceptable in terms of its impact on transportation, however, this would have been subject to conditions. Waste management. The alley is not serviced by the London Borough of New and Waste Collection Services, and as such, residents would need to drag the waste and recycling bin bins approximately 85 metres down the alley to the highway. Due to the poor quality of the public realm and the distance of where the waste and recycling is situated, the reliance on putting bins out in this alley near the highway will result in clutter and is likely to lead to an increase in fly tipping and litter to the detriment of the immunity of the area and quality of the public realm. Furthermore, it is not considered acceptable to assume that all residents would be able to drag the bins this long distance. The proposal is therefore not considered acceptable in terms of its waste management arrangements. Sustainability. Matters of sustainability that relate to the nature and scale of this development are biodiversity and flood risk. In respect of biodiversity, soft landscaping is being proposed at the front and rear of the development. A green roof has also been included. Officers are supportive of these elements of the application proposal in principle. However, conditions would have been attached to the decision notice requiring additional information if officers were mindful to approve the application. Notwithstanding the above, the applicant has failed to provide a flood risk assessment which complies with the requirements for site-specific site flood risk assessments. The title breach assessment does not accurately assess the risk associated with a breach in the Thames tidal flood defences. The development could have the potential to result in exasperation exacerbation of flood risk and unacceptable harm to the safety of the intended occupants in the event of flooding. The proposal is not considered acceptable in terms of the flood risk matters. Officers have also considered the archaeological impacts which as outlined in the report could, could be suitably addressed via conditions of permission. Overall, consideration of all the material planning considerations and the various fundamental issues raised, Local Development Committee is asked to resolve to refuse planning permission for the reasons set out in the officer's report and this presentation.
Thank you. Uh, do we have uh, any questions for the officer? No. We do have uh, an objector, Councillor Easter. Did you want to say anything else? Um, you... um, well, it's it's almost academic, really, isn't it? After after that, I suppose one thing I note is that the borough seems to be littered with um, former places of worship. Um, in the Clinton Road was actually a church hall, and this too appears to be probably a um, a church hall of some sort. Um, the residents who spoke to me spoke very much in similar terms to the objections which you've heard carefully codified into regulations. And while they are very aware of the need for accommodation within the borough, what we want is good quality accommodation, uh, uh, that which is of good design, which um, does not compromise other people's living arrangements and more than anything else in this age no matter how we look at it um, of throw away things where everybody has dustbins and recycling bins and so on and so forth they're feeling that a residents would be unable to move their rubbish and b if necessary, emergency vehicles would not be able to access the building were very strong. It is an alleyway, as we've we've heard already. So um, those who have spoken to me, Chair, very much wanted me to make those uh, points. Um, it seems that it's um, impractical and unsatisfactory on a number of levels. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions to the objector? No, I don't see any hands up. Um, can we go, can I move this to the vote? Uh, Councillor Gray? Thank you, I, I, I seem therefore that the, uh, um, the people who are putting forward this proposal haven't bothered to, to turn up or withdraw the application. Would we have There's any... nobody here from the, um, the proposers of, of this application. There is nobody here. Hannah, did you have any update or have a go? Only that they, um, they would have been sent an invite to committee, but they seem to have chosen not to, not to represent themselves. Chair, can it just be you know, noted that there the gross disrespect from these developers for not even bothering, by all means it's their right to carry on the objection, but not even to bother to attend in order to order, argue their scheme is, is in well, my view anyway, uh, yet another negative about this uh, application. Thank you. Um, I hope that's noted. Uh, Councillor Patel, to leave Patel. Thanks, Chair. Yes, Chair, I fully agree with uh, Councillor Gray that we should send some sort of note that the committee to uh, notice this, that by the opinion that uh, was in the meeting. Thank you very much. If there's no other comments or questions, can we move to the vote, please? Um, the recommendation is to refuse uh, the application that's come through. Could we have it on the screen so members are? Thank you very much, Abigail. Um, uh, members, the application is to refuse parent admission for the reasons set out in the office report and the above presentation. Um, all those in favour of refusal?
Joy, was you able to... Yeah, I think that that's seven, and obviously Councillor Easter won't participate because she objected. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 10, uh, which is uh, 51 Clover Road, Scott, is going to be the officer for this item. Thank you. Just one second. Good evening, my name is Scott and I'm the case officer for the subject application, which is located at 51 Clover Road, Forest Gate, as displayed. The application is for full planning permission for a change of use from a four bedroom residential dwelling, use class C3, to a day nursery for under fives, falling within the new use class EF. The application site is displayed, which can be seen within the setting of a quiet street, which is residential in nature. The proposal fall, fails in principle on two key points. Firstly, the proposal will result in the conversion and loss of a family-sized dwelling house. The loss of this family-sized home will have a harmful impact on the supply of dwellings within the borough, for which there is a clear objective seeking protection. The subject property is accommodation of the type that the council is specifically seeking to retain as a family home, given the borough's priority need for family-sized housing. The proposal would contribute to further imbalance in Ewing's housing stock, prejudicing the borough's vision for housing provision to build a stable, mixed and balanced community. In respect to the second failing in principle, the nursery forms a community facility use designation, which has been proposed outside of an identified town or local centre or community facility opportunity area. The subject nursery at this location would be contrary to the council's objectives for concentrating community type facilities within such designated areas. Therefore, undermining the vitality and vibrancy of those centre locations where community facilities should be directed. The location outside of the designated areas would also conflict with the need to promote easy access to services across the borough in accordance with the wider vision and spatial strategy. There are exceptions where community facilities may be acceptable outside of designated areas. However, to be eligible to meet the exceptions test, it must be demonstrated in the first instance that the proposal will not result in the loss of existing housing. The proposal therefore fails. Nevertheless, the proposal also would fail to meet all six of the exception criteria. It is noted that the borough's town centre strategy is only as effective as it is consistently applied. Moving on to the remaining key considerations. The proposal is considered unneighbourly. Given the nature of the use, up to 20 children would have access to play outdoors throughout the day. This is likely to give rise to an increase in noise within the residential rear garden setting. Additionally, the proposal would result in a much higher pattern, pattern of use when compared to the previous use as a single dwelling house. With a considerable volume of vehicle movements, alternative transport mode trips, and pedestrian comings and goings to and from the site. It is likely that a portion of any local users will decide to drop off and pick up their children using a vehicle. Furthermore, due to the existing provision of a primary school and nurseries situated nearby on Earlham Grove, it is likely that the proposed nursery will draw notable trip generation from further afield, resulting in higher rates of private vehicle use. It is accepted that noise and disturbance associated with comings and goings is more difficult to control. However, this type of facility if this type of facility was placed within a town centre or opportunity area, noise and disturbance would be less damaging to neighbouring amenity by virtue of community and commercial facilities being grouped together within close proximity, superior public transport services, fewer residential units in the area, and a street scene which is able to accommodate larger numbers of people. In summary, the proposed change of use is likely to result in an increase in noise and disturbance markedly different in character when compared to the existing residential use and setting. This sentiment is further supported by the 11 objections received, which voice such concerns. These amenity impacts would be inappropriate within the context of this quiet residential street, given the nature and intensity of this use. Such noise and disturbance would be detrimental to the residential amenity and health and well-being of surrounding residents. 
The additional considerations displayed could be considered acceptable subject to conditions and planning obligation agreement. Local Development Committee is asked to resolve to agree, to agree the reasons for refusal as set out in the officer report and delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Development, Chief Planning Officer to refuse planning permission for the reasons as outlined in the report. That's me done. Thank you, Scott. Um, that's I conclusion to, to me. Um, I forgot to unmute myself. Any questions for Scott? No. If there's no questions for the officer, can we move to the recommendation? Councillor Gray? Yeah, just to um, echo my comments on the previous application, Chair. Again, another sign of disrespect to this committee. And, uh, you know, if just proposal ever comes back to this committee, I will, I will remember that disrespect. Still act appropriately, of course, but it's just not acceptable. Thank you very much, Councillor Gray. Um, moving on then, could we move to the recommendations which is refused? Um, could we have that on the screen, please? I should be up now. Yeah, thank you, members. Um, the local committee has been asked to resolve to agree the reasons for refusal to set out in the officer report, delegate authority to the director of planning and development, chief planning officer to refuse planning permission for reasons allowed as per pages 231 to 232. And thank you very much. Could we go back to the full screen? And all those members in favor of refusal? Yes, Chair, that's uh, unanimous, all eight of you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, item nine, sorry, item 10 was refused. Planning permission, and we move on to item 11, which uh, Adam, is going to lead on this because Lauren has actually left the council. Thank you. Very much. Could we just pass on our thanks to her for the time she was here? Thank you. And here's your site location and of course the actual site plan so in the form of gas works in relation to the borough so adam we can't hear you There was some sound, but it was just very, very, very faint. We still can't hear you, Adam. Any better now? 
Okay, you can hear me. I can't hear you. I can't hear you, unfortunately. I'm going to go run through this. Um, I will have to change what I changed back again. So my sincere apologies for this. I've... Hello, this is item 11 for Becton Gasworks and adjoining land of Marder Way, Becton 20.00111 bar. Uh, shown here is a site location, shown here Becton, and as you can see, you can see the gas works just on the right there. This is, a, this is a section 73 application to vary condition two approved plans and documents and condition three contamination, the remediation strategy, attached to planning permission 1701505 full, dated the 25th of July 2017, which granted permission for environmental improvement works is the remediation of the land and the gas holders. Policy SC1 of the local plan states that proposal should seek to ameliorate past environmental degradation and to enhance site potential and minimise future degradation. As previously stated, uh, environmental re remediation was approved on this site uh, under uh, 1701505 uh, and the principle of development is established. This application seeks to, uh, seeks to amend some, te uh, some technicalities of the original remediation strategy. The update, aim of the updated strategy is to address the outstanding contaminant hotspots between remediation areas RA04 and RA05, which have been identified as presenting a significant risk to identified receptors and therefore constitute a potential statutory liability to the national grid. What this essentially means is, as is often the case with land remediation, what the original assessment said the areas that needed to be attended to, um, needs to be expanded and something to some degree is limited uh, one site one identify site area doesn't need remediation and another one to and lbn environmental health officers are supportive of this application and have been consulted all the way through local development committee is asked to resolve to agree the reasons for approval as set out in this presentation and delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Development to grant planning permission based on the conditions listed in Appendix 6 and summarised within the officer's report. I will stop sharing the screen now. I apologise, I cannot hear any of you. Okay, can you hear us now? Okay, are there any questions for Adam? I will. No, it looks like there's no questions for you, Adam. Can we move to the recommendation? I can see a lot of heads nodding. Um, could we, sorry, Adam, could we just have the recommendation up on the screen? The recommendation for item 11 is to agree for reasons for approval as set out in this presentation and delegate authority to direct our planning to grant planning permission based on conditions listed in Appendix 6 and summarised within the officer's report. Thank you, Adam. Could we go back? Thank you, everyone. Could we go to the vote? Um, all those in favour? Yes, yeah, that's unanimous, Chair, all eight of you. Thank you, everyone. Um, at the next date of our meeting is on February the 1st, 2021. Uh, this was our last meeting of the current cycle. Can I thank all the officers and the members for attending and all those people that uh, came along as objectors or the applicants um, bearing in mind the comments from Councillor Gray and Councillor Patel as well for those who did not attend the meetings uh, for whatever reasons. Uh, and all of those members obviously that have left uh, the committee to join other committees and there have been a number of officers that have left to uh, join other organisations. Uh, with that in mind, can I just wish everybody uh, happy greetings for the year. Uh, we are under difficult times but I'm sure that we will be looking out for each other and I will carry on doing that. Thank you very much. Um, if any member has got any comments or want to say anything, I think we are well within the time scale. Um, it would be appropriate to say that. 
Councillor Mughal, did you want to say anything? Just want to say Merry Christmas and very Happy New Year to all the members and officers Thank you. and the member of the public. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Patel. Same Chair. Uh, Merry Christmas to everyone and a very, very Happy New Year. Councillor Rahman. Same thing. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone. Okay. I think, uh, and that goes from Councillor Khan and Councillor Gray as well. Um, thank you, everyone, and uh, good night. Have a good evening. Yeah.